Section 11 of topic four, paper eight, looks at risk management for debt securities. Now, when we're considering risk, uh, debt market risk, we're looking at the sensitivity of bond prices to changes in interest. And that sensitivity is measured by something called duration. Do I need to know duration for the exam? Yes, it's likely you're going to get at least one question on it. So we're told a measure, this is on uh, section 11.1, a measure of duration approximates to the percentage change in a bond price for a 1% change in interest rates. So if interest rates change by 1%, which is a big change, uh, then the bond price will move by the percentage of the duration. For example, if duration was five, the bond price would move by 5% for a 1% change in interest rates. Uh, and it's an inverse relationship. So if interest rates go up, the bond price goes down and vice versa. Now we can see the formula that we apply at the bottom of those bullet points. A percentage change in bond price is equal to minus duration. So that's recognizing the inverse relationship multiplied by a change in yield. Now, before we look at an example, uh, let's look at the relationship of the different variables with regard to a bond and duration. First one we look at, third bullet point there, is time to maturity. The longer the time to maturity, the higher the duration. That is, the bond price is going to change by more for a change in interest rate simply because you've got a longer period of cash flows that are affected. The next point tells us the lower the yield, the lower the yield of the bond, higher the duration, and the lower the coupon rate, the higher the duration. Now, there's no way around it. You just have to remember those relationships. Uh, it can be examined. It can be examined through a narrative question using those terminologies, or they'll give you some bond, uh, some bond characteristics, coupon, yield, time to maturity, and they're going to ask you which bond has got the highest bond price sensitivity, in other words, the one with the highest duration. Let's look at a bond duration example. If a five-year bond has a modified duration, I wouldn't worry about the modified duration. They're not going to go into that. Uh, modified duration, duration, call it what you will, of six. And is currently trading at 9750 What approximate price will the bond move to if the bond yield increases by 1%? Okay. We just slot the numbers into that very simple formula. Percentage change in bond price is minus six multiplied by the one per six. That is, it's going to go down 1%. Bond yield goes up 1%. We're saying the bond price with a duration of six will go down 6%. So the new bond price, we take the 9750, multiply it by 0.94. That is 1.94. 0, 0.6, it's going to drop by 6%, and that gives the new bond price of 9,165. Now, duration technically is the gradient of the price yield curve, and we get that through first stage uh, calcul um, calculus, but I, I, uh, we don't have to go there at all. Uh, I'm just introducing that because of the, um, the curvature of the curve may not be reflected in the calculation of the, uh, the straight line to the curve. So convexity measures the change in duration with respect to changes in interest rate, while duration, just as I've said, is a linear measure of the tangent. That's what I was searching for. Convexity takes the curvature of the price yield curve into account. Do I need to know this for calculation? No. But what you should be aware is that two measures of bond price sensitivity is duration and convexity. So they can throw that up in a, a one, two, three, four question. Which of the following measure bond price sensitivity? And the answer would be one and three or whatever, duration and convexity. Let's move on to derivatives, section 12. And uh, not surprisingly, Derivatives are instruments that derive their value from underlying assets. And there's different forms of derivatives. Futures, which are standardized contracts, standardized forward contracts that are exchange traded. Uh, 
Forwards, as it says, similar to futures, but they are tailored to the needs of the counterparties uh, and they're trading over the counter OTC. Options, well, we've already done a lot on options and we're going to look at option pricing in a moment again. Uh, and options can be exchange traded or over the counter. Remember, options provide the right, not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset. Now, swaps. Swaps, again, are over the counter. There are not exchange traded and two parties agree to exchange or swap a set of future cash flows. The most common type are interest rate swaps where you swap fixed rate for a floating rate. Uh, and the idea behind swaps are to lower cost of funds, increase returns, hedge, and it also comes into asset liability management in the world, world of pensions, etc. 12.5 looks at structured products. Uh, these are considered exec executive, exotic products formed by combining different types of basic derivatives. And we're given examples of structured products traded on the stock exchange being callable bull bear contracts, equity linked instruments. Now, paper eight, it's unlikely they're going to go into the details of these. But they, they do you expect you to know that these are examples of structured products. So callable bull bear contracts, where they track the price changes of underlying assets without needing investors to invest in those assets. I'll let you read the detail there. I, I wouldn't get unduly concerned about it for the exam. 12.5.2, we have equity linked instruments, three different types, bull, bear, and range. And these are debt instruments that are linked to equity. And then one that's been added relatively recently, the inline warrant. We're told it's a type of structured product arranged by stock exchange entitling investors to receive specified amount at expiry condition on one or two conditions. Conditions being the price of an underlying asset falling within a specified range or price of an underlying asset falling outside the specified range, known respectively as in the range ITR and out of the range OTR. And they are limited to a small number of Hang Seng Index actively traded stocks. So there you are. Inline warrant is now a structured product. Going on to the last section of topic four, paper eight, further discussion of stock options, and then this gets quite technical. Six factors that affect the price, the premium of a stock option, and there they are. Spot price, strike price, interest rate, volatility of underlying stock price, time to expiry, and dividend. So there's a lot of them, six determinants of an option price. Looking at them individually, the spot price, the higher the spot price, the more in the money, the more valuable a call option, the lower the spot price, more the money of a put option. And that's because call option, the strike is to buy, put option, the strike is to sell. And it's just a, a logical relationship. Strike price, higher the strike price, less in the money a call option will be. So the lower the price and the lower the strike price of the put option, uh, then less in the money a put option will be uh, so the, 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 the mirror image of each other. Now, interest rates are a wee bit trickier. The higher the interest rate, uh, the way I think of it is, the more attractive it is to put money on deposit. So if you're looking to buy a stock, then rather than buy the stock, buy a call option and put money on deposit and earn the interest. And then when you exercise call option, use the money on deposit to pay for the stock. So if interest rates are higher, the more attractive that transaction is. So a call option increases in price when interest rates rise. Put options are the other way around. Put options fall in price when interest rates rise. So that's a wee story to let you uh, lock into the relationship between interest rates and option prices. Now, the volatility of underlying stocks, this one's straightforward. The more volatile uh, the stock price the higher the value of the option because there's more chance of the option going into the money. So for both calls and puts, the higher the price volatility of the underlying security, the higher the value of the call and the put option. Time to expiry. Uh, the shorter the time to expiry, uh, the lower 
the value of the option because you've not got much time left. Uh, and that is the case with American style options. With European style options, uh, they have a longer time to expire. The effect of the time to maturity, less certain than with American style options. We're really ducking out there. It's a lot more that can be said on that. And if you study options to any great depth, you'll look into all the mathematical models. But no, with American style options, the shorter the time to expiry, uh, the lower the value of the option. Then dividend. When a dividend is paid, the stock price will fall. So a dividend uh, payment lower the value of a call option, increase the value of a put option simply because the stock price falls. Now, different risk parameters. Uh, ooh, will you get examined on this one question? Really quite tricky. Uh, these parameters measure uh, how option prices move. Delta. Delta of an option measures sensitivity of the option price to changes in the price of the underlying stock. And you can see there, delta value of a long call, a short put, always between zero and one. Delta value of a long put, short call, always between minus one and zero. And we have a little table there showing you delta value, long call, short put, in the money up to one, at the money 0.5, out of the money down to zero. What I would take from this table, and I wouldn't get wrapped up because if they're going to examine, it's going to be one question. But always remember, at the money, options are will have a, de a delta value of 0.5, and it will be negative for a long put short call. I've given you an example there, top of page 26, of a delta hedging example. Please read through it, study study it, see the relationship, but we're re really on the periphery of the material of paper eight here. If they were to set a question on that, you're unlucky. But be aware of what the delta represents. It's the sensitivity of the option price to changes in the stock price itself. Then we have other risk parameters. These risk parameters are referred to as the Greeks. Now that you don't have to go into too much detail, just be aware of what it represents gamma measures the rate of change in the option delta. So gamma there, the Greek letter, change in delta divided by dollar change in the underlying stock price. Now these ones I would remember because it's easy to set a question on them asking you which one represents what. Vega measures change in op option price for change in volatility of the underlying stock price. Vega starts with V and it measures sensitivity of option price with regard to volatility, VV. Theta, theta starts with two, T, and it's time. So it measures the effect of passage of time on the option price. So the uh, faster uh, the time moves, then the, uh, the theta will reflect how the option price will move. Rho measures the change in the value of the option with respect to change in the risk-free interest rate, RR, risk-free rate, rho. Basic option trading strategies. I think this is probably giving you a bit too much uh, information than what you need for getting ready for the paper eight exam. Uh, but we've listed there market view, delta, gamma, theta for each of the four positions, the long call, the short call, the long put, and the short put. Uh, if you are heavily involved in options, please read through uh, and make sure you're happy with all that detail. If options are really uh, something that is brand new to you and maybe a step too far, I wouldn't worry about those four diagrams and the related uh, views. What I would know though, and this is the last item topic for paper eight, is option pricing 13.4. Now we're not going to go through the uh, the details of option pricing, that's paper nine if you ever get there. It's just the fact that there are three common models used to price options. This is all in the world of mathematics. The binomial option pricing model, which was the first, that was then developed into the Black-Scholes-Merton model, which is an actual formula. And then simulation, and simulation involves the use of a computer with repeated random processes. 
Now, simulation, uh, a popular method is Monte Carlo simulation. Now, here's the question I've seen. Which one of the following is not an option pricing model? And they will give you binomial option pricing, Black Scholes Martin model, simulation or Monte Carlo, and the capital asset pricing model. For some reason, that's the one they throw in. Capital asset pricing model is all to do with estimating required return on investment. It is not an option pricing model. So that little tip I will leave you with. That brings us to the end of topic four. You're going to get a, a reasonable number of questions from topic four and, and quite a few of them will be technical in nature. As ever, the best way to prepare for topic four is to do practice questions. And we've got many, many practice questions covering all of the sections on examinator.online. So as ever, go to examinator.online and get into the practice questions for topic four to help build up your short-term memory for the paper eight exam.